Hi, I'm Ann Applebaum, and I'm here with Intelligence Squared this evening uh, to do a short conversation with a really remarkable author and writer, uh, Paul Caruana Galizia, who has just written a spectacular book uh, which tells the story of the place he grew up, which is the island of Malta, the country of Malta, um, as well as the life of his mother, um, Daphne Caruana Galizia, who was a um, who, who was a, who was Malta's most famous journalist. She was the first woman columnist. Uh, she was one of the best known people on the island, um, and she was also horribly assassinated in a, a, by a car bomb uh, in 2017. Um, Paul, after her assassination, became a journalist himself, and he has now since won uh, multiple awards. Uh, the book is a moving account of her life, but it also places her life into two important contexts. Uh, one of them is the context of the history of Malta, and the other is the context of the rise of international kleptocracy. Uh, that was her specialty. She wrote about kleptocracy. She wrote about, she, did, she was an investigative journalist. Uh, she wrote about corruption. And that was also why she was uh, brutally murdered. Um, so I will begin. Welcome, Paul. I'm, I'm so glad to have you with me today. Thank you so much, Anne, for that kind introduction. I'm really happy to be here. And so um, one of the striking things about your book is that you start with Malta. And it's not a place that most mm -hmm. people know well. Um, and people have an idea of it being a kind of vacation island, um, you know, off in the Mediterranean. Um, and you, you, you tell a, a darker story uh, of the history of the country, and you use the expression amoral familiarism. Could you, could you begin by explaining what that is and how it describes the political system uh, of the country? Yes, of course. So I, you know, the, the, idea, the idea of the book is to introduce people to my mother. And quite early on, I realized I, I couldn't do that unless I also introduced Malta, you know, the country that shaped her um, and, and made her a journalist. And my mother, as a university student, studied anthropology and um, as part of that course, learned about this idea you mentioned, so that um, some areas um, have a social structure that that is sometimes called the moral familism. And you tend to find it where formal state structures are very weak. And so the family unit develops in, in response to that. So the bonds within a family are much stronger um, than the loyalties you might feel to the rule of law, to democracy itself. So you would, you know, you would never report a relative to the police. Um, you would think only about the immediate material interests of your own family. And, and you would assume other people do the same. And that has really serious implications for, for governance. So in the simplest example I can think of is if, if you assume no one pays tax, then you, you don't pay tax yourself. And so institutions lose funding, the state becomes even weaker and the family becomes more important. Um, and my mother, increasingly, especially towards the end of her life, as Malta became more corrupt, saw it as a, a very useful way of understanding the problems she was reporting on every day. Right, so it's a, it's a place where um, it's kind of state institutions were weak, where clan, family and almost clan relationships were much more important um, and where, as you say, as you've written, clearly the rule of law was very weak. Um, one thing that's also striking about the book is you talk about how high expectations were when Malta finally joined the European Union, that, that membership at the European Union might somehow fix that problem, um, might make Malta more law abiding, might make it similar to other European democracies. But I think your mother was disappointed by that. Yes, that's right. And there was something I realized when I was writing it really tragic about the arc of her life because she was she was born just two weeks before Malta um, became independent from Britain, two weeks before it decolonized. And for a that was 19 it was September 1964. And for most of the 60s, her really early childhood, it looked like Malta might become an independent, prosperous nation. But starting in the 70s, 
as was the fashion at the time, Malta um, became very socialist, started experimenting with ideas of closing off its economy to become self-sustaining and so on. And so she grew up in that very closed world where, you know, you'd only have one brand of chocolate or toothpaste available, all made domestically, one type of shoe you could buy. And so for her, the idea of Europe became very important. The idea of the West, anyway, she called it. And that that was available to her through um, British magazines and newspapers her parents subscribed to, so my maternal grandparents subscribed to. And as she as she grew up, so late 70s, um, early 80s, the prospect of European union, uh, un- union membership started seeming like something that might happen one day in Malta. So she spent much of the 80s thinking about it, hoping for it. And again, it was also, you know, part of, of what was happening around the world. And in Malta in the late 80s, we had a really important general election, a kind of, in the book I call it, like Malta's end of history moment, where, you know, the, the country had a choice between continuing down this, like China, pro-China, pro-Libya part, or, or turning west towards NATO and the European Union. And, and the Western side won, but really just by a whisker. And so the accession program began in the 90s. And my, my mother really believed it. You know, it looked like things were changing. And I, I remember it. I grew up in the 90s. Suddenly the economy liberalized, people became richer. But then what we didn't realize, and I think my mother didn't realize, is that while the economy was reformed, the the forms of governance we had in Malta were never properly reformed since 1964, since decolonization. So Malta ended up with this very globalized economy, but these rickety, you know, 1960s, immediately post-colonial institutions. And that proved to be a real, a really toxic mix. Mm-hmm. And it was really this mix and it was the fight against that system that inspired her to become a journalist and led her to this very unusual role where, as I said, she became a, she wrote a a, a blog, essentially, an online yes. column that became the most read piece of, you know, source of information yes. on the island. Yes, that's right. And and so, what, so when, the, when those institutions really started failing and... Um, and as is often the case in countries like Malta, journalists become the kind of institution of last resort. And I, it took me a long time to realize something is really wrong because my, you know, my mother always reported on corruption, but it was low level bribery, you know, Maltese drug traffickers bribing Maltese judges. But then almost imperceptibly, she found herself reporting on huge flows of money coming from post-Soviet states looking for a a way into the European Union, you know, oligarchs buying Maltese passports. Um, And and it happened so quickly. Again, she she almost didn't realize herself. And because those institutions couldn't bear those massive strains of money, um, the few kind of non-corrupt civil servants we had began turning to my mother. And if you think about it, the situation is absurd. You know, police officers would, you know, acquire material and felt unable to do anything with it other than pass it on to my mother who'd report on it. And But at the same time, that exposed her a great deal. And as my brothers and I always said, it's, it is significant that in the end, it was my mother, a journalist, who was murdered rather than a police officer, a magistrate, a judge, or, or a politician. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, the in the, in the, in the years, I mean, really, it's, it goes on for many years, the years before she died, the smear campaign that was run against yes. her. Um, I find smear campaigns very interesting, actually, because it's very they're run in a very similar way in similar countries. So I have a friend who's a Mexican journalist who has, you know, almost also a woman who has very similar descriptions of what happens to her that I found in in, in your book about your mother. You know, they are caricatures of her. You know, she's a witch. She's old. She's she's ugly. You know, the you know they're they're focused on 
um, you know, very, very focused on her being a woman and being weak or being uppity yes. or something like this. Um, and I think yes. it's a pattern that now repeats itself um, because it's it's a way of, um, you know, kind of getting rid of or diminishing criticism. Um, you know, if you can make someone into an online hate figure, which it's now, of course, so easy to do. And if you can do it using government resources, um, you know, that's, yes. that's, that's a way to kind of undermine criticism of you. And that's 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 what happened uh, also to your mother. That, that is really what happened to a to a degree that became became extreme in the final years of her life. In part, that had a lot to do with the Internet. So growing up, it was always an issue growing up. You know, people would call up the house pre mobile phones. And, uh, you know, I'd answer and hear a voice saying, tell that poor of your mother to stop writing this, tell that which you call a mother to, or people would send stuff in the post. But um, that, you know, purely for technological reasons that made it feel like less of an issue somehow. But then the internet, it just kind of allowed that form of abuse to be industrialized you know, the costs were non-existent. People could just send emails, write their own blogs, you know. Um, but um, you are right. There was something especially ugly, especially misogynistic about the form of abuse. So it was always that she was a witch. And it became so oppressive. It, it affected her physically, you know, she, she felt unable to leave the house. Um, and that allowed them to say even more, she's a witch hiding out in her house. We grew up in the countryside, so they called her the witch of Bidnia, this rural area where we lived. And, and then she started putting on weight because she was always at home, isolated. So they started, you know, calling her fat, fat, lonely, a witch. And it, it was an attempt to undermine her. It was an attempt to completely dehumanize her. And as a campaign of dehumanization, it was so successful that it continued after her murder. So after her murder, a group of Maltese journalists kind of brought to light all this, all this disinformation, all, all this slander. Um, on Facebook, Facebook is, is really the most popular social media platform in Monta still. And, you know, people, people were celebrating her murder. They were celebrating the car bombing of, of a journalist on the day it happened and continued to celebrate it, you know, even afterwards. And it, it, it just, I remember thinking Malta is a really tribal partisan place. But it was at that point I realized how bad things are. It wasn't that we simply didn't have a shared understanding of, of reality, of our politics, of what was happening, but that we, we, we didn't even see each other as, as humans. Like I, I could never, I, n I never thought we'd get to that point where you would celebrate a, a car bombing of your fellow citizen, of a journalist. But, but that was coming from the government. It was coming from the ruling party of the time whose the ruling corruption party. she was in co on, on course to expose. That's right. And the thing about Malta is you have this really good, good kind of test of, of how, how coordinated it is or how spontaneous. So my mother wrote in English, um, most of um, the country speaks Maltese as a first language. Most of the supporters of the ruling party, which is still the ruling party, speak Maltese exclusively. And as my mother once said, the, they, the supporters and, and voters of, of this party, um, are taught to hate me independently of what I write. And um, it, was, it was later that the government just kind of stopped caring. And Muscat, the prime minister at the time, actually assigned an aide working from within the prime minister's office to, to run a campaign of, of harassment against my mother and my father and my brothers. You know, he, this was his day-to-day -day job, coordinating harassment campaigns mm -hmm. against us. And, and, and yet at the uh, same time, she was the most widely read journalist in Malta. Yes, she was. 
and and this is the problem they had with her that they they especially when she started her blog they had very few levers they could pull on so when when she wrote exclusively for her for her paper the malta independent the government would do things like withhold you know government advertising revenue not invite the newspapers other journalists on government press stores that kind of thing but with her blog, um, they just couldn't, right? It, it was her. They had no kind of levers to pull on except attacking her directly. But because of these failings, we were talking about, you know, that the police wouldn't investigate crimes, um, that the AG wouldn't prosecute them. My mother became not just, not just this, the, you know, the most important source of news, um, in the country, but almost the only source of news. People had nowhere else to go to. And the kind of, you know, the flip side of of people seeing um, the harassment my mother endured, um, that she would keep going with her work anyway, showed sources that she is a journalist they could trust, that no matter the pressure brought to bear on her, she would report truthfully and fully that she wouldn't be kind of intimidated into giving up sources and, and so on. But um, it, it did, you know, as, as she wrote a few months before she was killed, when, when the plan to, to assassinate her had, in fact, been set in motion, she wrote something like, you know, do your worst, you bastards, until the only option you have left is to take a contract out on my life. And... And they did do it because there was nothing else they could do to stop her. After her death, there were two things that happened. Maybe we can talk about both of them. I mean, one of them is that you and your brothers um, really dedicated yourselves to, uh, in a way, finishing her work, You know, continuing some of her investigations. Um, one of your brothers worked on uh, one in particular. Um, also, ha help getting other journalists, including from The Guardian in the UK, um, to you know, to interest themselves in some of the material that she dug up, and to begin to to knit together some of some of the stories that she'd found, um, and then the other the other thing that happened was that a kind of move, popular movement of support for you and what you were doing, as well as in memory of her and her life, um, became a real factor in in Maltese politics. Yes, so we. It's funny because in retrospect, it looks like we had a very well planned out campaign. But in fact, we just we just thought we need to pull on every every lever available to us. So the journalism was was one thing we thought of. We thought she was a journalist. There were stories she hadn't finished working on. We can't take them up ourselves. Let's pass the material on. And then we, you know, Malta is a small state, so very sensitive to international pressure. So we went to the European Parliament, we went to the Council of Europe and brought, you know, their pressure to bear down on the country. But um, the most important, like long term important uh, development of that campaign, in my view, is the growth of civil society in Malta. Again, that was another failed institution. So public life in Malta was dominated by either of the two political parties or the Catholic Church. And I mean completely dominated. There were no spontaneous protests. It was either party or church. The paper, the media was controlled by those institutions. But then when there were really key arrests starting in 2019, pro the country erupted in protest completely. And a number of those protest groups had formed immediately after my mother's assassination, especially a group of women who called themselves Occupy Justice. And, and they set up in 2017 and have been campaigning ever since. But it was that, that burst of protest in 2019 that made me think the country has changed. This is a new feature of, of public life in Malta. Um, it's the development of civil society that is spontaneous. It's not church-led, party-led, and and it looks like it's there to stay. And to bring it back to that amoral familism point, the the one the one kind of essential symptom of a place 
that can be described in that way is you have no civil society because it's only the family you care about. You don't care about the state. You don't care about the community. It's just your family. And so this kind of change happened, you know, the change my mother always wrote for, you know, always hoped for, always kind of wanted in her columns. And, and it, it happened as a result of her assassination. This was a kind of tipping point for the country. Um, you write very um, movingly in the book about the, um, you know, the, and, and it's, it's, very, so it's a complicated story, the investigation into who killed her and how she was killed, um, which isn't finished yet. Um, we, we know, we, we know some, we know some elements, yes. of it, but, but not others. Maybe we can finish if you can talk a little bit about that and what your hopes are for that, particularly given this civic movement that has grown up, that is putting yes. real pressure now on the multi establishment to find out really what happened and who was responsible and who gave the orders and why. Yes. So, okay. So the. Broadly speaking, there were three sets of criminal proceedings against the hitmen, um, so three Maltese men who planted the bomb and detonated it. All three have now pleaded guilty and are serving prison terms. Um, there was a middleman who was pardoned in exchange for evidence um, against the man he says commissioned the murder. That man um, was arrested in 2019, which is what triggered all the protests, and his due to stand trial for the murder sometime next year. There's also a, um, a trial we expect of three men who supplied the bomb. Now, that, that, you know, if that doesn't sound complicated enough, we also had a public inquiry um, which looked into the broader um, circumstances of her murder, which my brothers and I campaigned for. And we actually, the campaign um, was based on a, an idea we had around the, the, the special rapporteur, the Council of Europe, assigned to Boris, Nemtsov, Boris Nemtsov's murder um, uh, to throw you know, light on the circumstances surrounding the murder. Anyway, that public inquiry finally reported about two years ago and, and concluded that the state bears responsibility for the murder because corruption got to such a point, there was institutional collapse. So the public inquiry has made a number of recommendations, you know, constitutional reforms to prevent something like this happening again. None of those recommendations have been implemented yet. Um, more crucially, I think, as a test for the country um, is whether any of the senior politicians who at this point undeniably participated in an attempted cover up of the murder and who are the subjects of her corruption reporting, whether any of those will be prosecuted. Because to this date, there hasn't been a single prosecution related to those big corruption stories. And I feel that's an important test for the country. As much as, as, much as bringing the murder case to a conclusion, the country needs to be able to say that we think corruption is a major problem. It will be prosecuted. And we will bring prosecutions against people who were prime ministers, even. Tell me whether you think this is a, a model or whether there are lessons for others. Um, this link between a kind of movement for transparency, for anti-corruption, uh, and for journalism and for the free, free press. Um, you know, are, you know, are those forces that can that can help democratize and. Um, you know, and 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 create more more civic, better institutions in other places. I mean, do you think that what's happened in Malta is something that others can learn from? I think so. I think we are unfortunately a kind of a warning to other countries, and you know, we are we are what ha we are now an example of what happens when you ignore um, when you ignore institutional rot, when you, when you think of rule of law issues as some abstract, you know, distant problems. Um, and we are an example of what happens when you let a populist government um, kind of free reign to run, to run a country as, as it sees fit. And it, 
it's funny. I, Muscat was elected in 2013, so you know, three years before before Brexit, Trump, all the really like signal moments in in recent political history. And I thought, how funny that if we are looking at Malta as an early indicator, it was all there in a grain of sand. You know, Muscat is is shoots up to power on these impossible promises rules with a really strong executive, parliament unable to check him, the institutions unable to check him, huge flows of foreign money, Azerbaijan, Russia, China. And what we're left with is is just the free press attempting to fight it back. And it's, it's actually very similar. I mean, you think of there was a similar situation in Slovakia. Um, you know, it's not unlike the Navalny movement in Russia uh, you know, if you if you think about the anti-corruption movements in Ukraine leading up to 2014, um, you know, yes. you, you do you do see a pattern where one of the ways to fight autocratic populism and state capture is a kind of journalism plus civil society, um, yes. plus you know, good lawyers, um, plus people who are interested yes. in applying and making real the rule of law. Yes, I think so. Sorry. So the summary version is that for a long time, Malta thought real change had to come through politics. But I think what we've seen in Malta is it can and probably should come through civil society and maybe through the courts, right, through public interest litigation, which is what we've been doing. And for a long time in Malta, we just ignored those tools for change. And they turned out to be the most powerful. And, and the most fast acting, much better, certainly, than the parliamentary process. So thank you, Paul. Thanks for a fascinating conversation. Um, the book is excellent. It is really worth your time. It is very easy to read, very well written. It's called Death in Malta, an Assassination in a Family's Quest for Justice, and it's available in your local bookstores. Uh, I'm Anne Applebaum, and you've been listening to Intelligence Squared.